John Shepherd Barron was an old-fashioned Scotsman. About 50 years ago, one afternoon, he felt the need to get some cash. He went to the local bank, and the bank had just closed for the weekend. And he requested the manager to reopen the bank so he could get some cash, because he had to put it in context. Think about 50 years ago. What can you do without money in hand? <laughs> and the manager refused to open the bank, despite John Shepard Barron's pleas. So he was obviously frustrated. He was a dyed-in-the-wool engineer. He really needed to change the situation because he was frustrated by the fact that he could not get hold of cash from his, his own bank account. <laughs> and that had a significant impediment to his weekend plans. So what he did was, ultimately over the years, created the automatic teller machine, which we now take for granted as the ATMs pretty much everywhere. The ATM technology, as you can think of, it's just a, you know, it's sitting in a hole in the wall and has dramatically transformed modern commerce. It has empowered people from all parts of the world to get or to gain access to their own resources at their convenience, at any point in time, at any location in the world. And it is seamless. It's interconnected. It, over time, it got married to enormous security technologies, fantastic telecommunication technologies, wonderful instrumentation that are offering us new capabilities. If there is a suspicion of uh, some fraud, you get an alert. These are re results of iterative, disciplined, continuous improvements. That is an overarching principle in engineering design. But ATM is ATM. We can call it a hardware that is coupled with numerous software technologies and communication technologies. But let's think about the technology that has no form or no shape that connects us all in a phenomenal way, in an unusual way, in an extraordinary way. We give it a name called internet. This is what the Guardian talks about the internet. The internet is so vast and formless that it's hard to imagine it being invented. It's easy to picture Thomas Edison inventing the light bulb because a light bulb is easy to visualize. You can hold it in your hand and examine it from every angle. The internet is the opposite. It's everywhere, but we see it only in, gl in glimpses. The internet is like the Holy Ghost. It makes itself knowable to us by taking possession of the pixels on our screens to manifest sites, apps, and email. But its essence is it's always everywhere. What do you make out of this? But you don't want to hear more about internet from me. You want to hear it from the person who co-designed it, developed it, known as one of the fathers of the internet. He happens to be vice president and chief internet evangelist for Google. He's won numerous awards. Example, the Turing Prize, known as the Nobel Prize in Computer Science. He has won the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Bush, National Medal of Technology from President Clinton, and most recently got the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, and also got elected to the Royal Society, one of the oldest living scientific societies in the world, founded by Isaac Newton, and more. And, but more importantly, a life fellow of IEEE. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my deep honor and pleasure to introduce Vint Cerf. Good morning. Well, thank you very much. I always get nervous when people clap before you said anything. It feels like you should just sit down because it won't get any better than that. Uh, first of all, I, uh, what is it that they say? Of all the introductions I've had, that was the most recent. <laughs> and, and thank you very much, Guru. I appreciate that. Also, I want to associate myself with the things that uh, Barry Shoup said. These, this is a good recipe. What you heard was exactly what you need to know about leadership. But I'd like to spend this morning talking about risk and innovation. Actually, now that I think of it, this Holy Ghost uh, model, is, I hadn't thought about that. My title at Google is Chief Internet Evangelist, so somehow that matches up pretty well. <laughs> I didn't actually ask for the title. When, when I joined the company almost a decade ago, or a little more than a decade ago, uh, they said, what title do you want? And I said, how about Archduke? <laughs> and there was this pause, 
And then you know, Larry and Eric and Sergey came back and they said, you know, the previous Archduke was Ferdinand and he was assassinated in 1914 and it started World War I, so maybe that's not a good title to have. Why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? Now, okay, I can do that. All right, so uh, do I have a clicker or is somebody going to change the slides for me? Or do I go, whoo, like that? <laughs> it didn't work, so I'm assuming there's... No, there it is. The magic man with the controls. There we go, let's see what happens. Nothing happens. <laughs> Nothing happens. Oops, something happens. Okay, all right, good. <laughs> And now the slide disappeared. <laughs> this is almost as good as finding the power strip with it plugged into itself, you know. It's, you know. <laughs> All right, let's, that's, you know, perpetual uh, mumble. Why does this thing keep disappearing? Is this a, a design flaw? What happens is the slides come and go, basically. All right, let's, well, I'll look back there if I have to. So let's talk a little bit about the atmosphere that allows for innovation to happen. And the first thing is the freedom to fail. Because when you're trying out something new, when you have an idea you're not sure is going to work, if you aren't given the freedom to fail, you're not going to try anything very risky. Fortunately, at Google, we give that, we give that freedom to our engineers. We tell them, tackle hard problems, shoot for the moon, even if you don't make it to the moon, it's okay. You may get a lot farther along than if you just try to do 10% incremental improvements. So freedom to fail is very important to create an atmosphere of innovation. The sec th second thing is that obviously if you are successful, you should be rewarded for taking the risk and having successfully innovated. And we try to do that at Google and I'm sure other companies uh, do that as well. The third thing, uh, I wanted to describe Steve Jobs' challenge. After the first Pixar movie was very successful, they decided to build a new building in which to continue their work. And Jobs was trying to, as the CEO of the company, was trying to figure out exactly what they should incorporate into the building design in order to encourage innovation. And he came to a very interesting conclusion. He wanted casual interactions, which is one of the sources of innovation. People just bumping into each other saying, I have this problem, what is your problem? And you have a discussion, somebody says, oh, you know, you know, there's a way to do that. So he was trying to figure out how to deal with the building design to encourage these casual interactions. And he concluded the best way to do it was to put the bathrooms in the middle of the building so that everybody would have to go to the same place now, of course, nobody paid much attention to anything except getting you know, to the center of the building. But on the way back, they were a little more relaxed and you had, these, uh, you, know, you had these casual interactions. And so this was a purposeful design to try to encourage opportunities uh, for innovation. And finally, uh, the thing that I have found personally is that there's more opportunity to innovate when you work in relatively small groups, four, five, six, 10 people at most. And part of the reason for that is that everybody can more or less stay in sync. You know, if you have really big groups, then coordinating takes a huge amount of your time. And that impedes the rate at which innovation can happen, but small groups can stay in touch with each other. At Google, we even went through uh, what we internally called a defragmentation uh, effort in order to bring people physically closer together who were working on the same problems in order to encourage that particular uh, amount of interaction. Uh, and also at Google, in order to encourage innovation, we have an investment strategy which says about 70% of our development and research dollars go into the core business, but 20% go into adjacent kinds of things, and 10% goes into blue sky. And that, for example, self-driving cars and the Google Glass and many of the other things that you've heard about are all part of that 10% investment model. Uh, one thing that I will say is that Google also recognizes that engineers are easily distracted. Look, let's face it, we never grow up, we're kids, right? We're curious about everything. So all engineers are going to spend 20% of their time do doing stuff that may not have anything to do with the business that they're in. And that's okay, we just built that into the business model. We said, okay, you can spend 20% of your time doing things that you find interesting and curious, just don't do anything illegal. Uh, and what happens is that a lot of people will discover other projects that they have an interest in. 
And so in all honesty, sometimes this turns out to be 120% time. You know, you work on your job and then you work another 20% on this other thing that you got excited about. But it's enthusiasm and interest is not something you can buy. It's something that comes from inside and you want to encourage that. At Pixar, there was another lesson that I took away, uh, and that was that uh, in the movie business, it's very typical to build compartments into your organization. So you have a group of people over here who are working on movie X, and another group over here are working on movie Y. We keep them separate from each other. They're not allowed to talk to each other about the problems they're experiencing or the excitement that they have. Steve says, I have a company full of very creative people and I am not going to waste them by isolating them. I'm going to allow any of them to work on any problem. And that was a, a decision which was unlike the normal uh, practice in the movie business. It means that we have to trust everybody not to spill you know, secrets about the movies to the outside. But it means that whenever there's a problem over here, I have access to the talent that's over there that might be able to help solve the problem. We're back to encouraging innovation by that tactic. Uh, there are things called skunk works, uh, and in fact, we have the former chief skunk in the audience here, Al Romag. Al Romag is now the chief operating officer at National Academy of Engineering, but before that, he had the stinkiest job in the world at Lockheed Martin. I wanted him to have a card that said, this job stinks, but he didn't put that on his job. Al knows the power of Skunk Works, and so do I, because some of my most interesting successes have come from operations that have been isolated from the rest of the business. And you do that for a reason. You don't want the daily and the quarterly press for profit and top line growth and so on to interfere with trying to solve a hard problem. And so building Skunk Works into the operation is one way to do that. It's risky. Because the, this group is isolated from the rest of the business, they may, they're a cost center, but they may not be a profit center. It's, so it's risky, but it may be the only way that you can get things done. So when I worked on MCI Mail way back in the 1980s, it was a uh, commercial electronic mail service. It was fairly early days for public electronic mail. It had already been around on the ARPANET for 10 years, because it first arose in 1971, but this was a commercial uh, effort. And we kept this completely isolated from the rest of the MCI telephone business. And although it wasn't a huge uh, business success, it was really an interesting technical uh, success, at least as I see it. Because not only did we allow the MCI mail system to, to interact with any other email system around, but we also allowed for faxes, telexes, and postal addresses in the email. So you could actually send a message to someone with a postal address, and we would print it, put it in an envelope, and mail it if the party didn't have email. Now, back then, 30 years ago, not everybody did have email. So that was an interesting thing. ARPANET itself was a kind of skunk works operation. It was originally um, developed because ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, was supporting research in computer science and artificial intelligence. And they had about a dozen universities doing this work. And the, the uh, universities, each of them, would say every year, you need to buy us another world-class computer so we can do world-class research. And even ARPA couldn't afford to do that way back in the 1970s when machines cost many millions of dollars. So they said, we're going to build a network and you can share your resources. Everybody hated that. But we said, we're building the network anyway. And oh, by the way, we're going to test a new technology called packet switching, which you know the uh, run-of-the-mill telecommunications people said wouldn't work. So ARPA said, you know, we're going to build this anyway. We invited AT&T to join us in the research. They said it won't work, it's, you know, so we're not interested, but we'll lease you telephone lines so you can build your stupid network. So they did, and we did, and it worked. <laughs> so ARPANET is another example of the skunk works. Uh, and certainly the work that goes on uh, at Lockheed Martin, uh, it's uh, skunk works uh, in California, produced some of the most innovative aircraft ever built. So let's talk a little bit about technical design and innovation. Uh, one thing, which uh, you may have heard the term, the rise of the stupid network. Uh, the internet is really a stupid network when you think about it. The internet layer of protocol, the thing that binds everything together, doesn't have a clue, or the packets of the internet protocol, don't have a clue about how they're being carried. They don't know whether they're being carried over a satellite link, an optical fiber, or a radio channel. 
and they don't have to know. That was a really important design decision. So when new technology came along to do new transmission things, we could just plop the internet protocol on top of that. So when Bob Kahn and I were doing this work, we consciously said, don't allow the internet protocol to know anything about how it's being carried in order to make it future-proof to some extent. Uh, and that was important. The other thing that, that these packets don't know is what they're carrying. It's like a postcard. It doesn't know what you wrote on it. So the internet packets carry a little bag of bits from point A to point B with some probability greater than zero. That's all we ask of it. Uh, and so that means some packets get lost, some, some of them get duplicated, somebody at the higher level of protocol like TCP has to sort all that out. But the whole idea here was that if you had a new application, you didn't have to change the network because the network didn't know anything about applications. It has no idea what the bits mean. It's the software at the edges of the net that determine what those bits mean, and that means you can add new applications whenever you want to. And that uh, is a source of what I call on this slide permissionless innovation. You didn't have to go and get permission from all the ISPs in the world or change the network in order to introduce a new application. And that invites uh, the kind of uh, innovation that we've seen over the last 35 years or so. Uh, the same thing can be said for mobiles. Uh, some of you may know that uh, the Internet was originally designed in 1973. What you, some of you will surely know is that the Motorola uh, mobile phone was also invented in 1973 by Marty Cooper. And I didn't know anything about his work in 73. He didn't know anything about the Internet either. But in 1983, we both turned our systems on. The Internet was turned on January 1st, 83. And somewhere in 83, Marty Cooper gets the first handheld uh, mobile phone in operation for uh, Motorola. And uh, in 83, I learned about that uh, and from a friend of mine who invited me to lunch. And uh, I came over and he said, I have something to show you. He pointed at the table and there's this thing sitting on the table. I said, what's that? And he said, it's a phone. And they said, where are the wires? And he said, there aren't any wires, it's wireless. It's, you know, it's about this tall plus a whip antenna. And so I started asking him questions about it. And uh, he said, I don't know, why don't you call the guy that invented it? So I called Marty Cooper on the mobile phone. And I said, hey, <laughs> Marty, you know, how does this work? In, in the course of the conversation, I said, uh, how long does the battery last? And he says, about 20 minutes. But it's okay, it weighs three and a half pounds. You can't hold it up longer than that anyway. So, <laughs> so it was, you know, carefully structured. To... So these two things, though, these mobile phone and the Internet, didn't really come together until Steve Jobs came along in 2007. I, I may be insulting Nokia a little bit here because they had some pretty innovative feature phones. But really, the smartphone shows up in 2007, which, by the way, is less than a decade ago, if you can believe that. I mean, that is really hard to realize that we have become so accustomed to these devices in less than a decade. But what's interesting about the mobile phones is that they have an application programming interface, typically for iOS and for Android. If you're an application writer, you don't have to know how the mobile phone works. You just have to know how to push things in and out of that API. That isolates you from a lot of detail and allows you to innovate in the space at a higher level of abstraction. That's the power of layering in architecture, and that's one of the reasons internet and mobile phone technology and maybe other technologies that you're going to invent uh, will make so much progress because you isolate people from having to know too much. Uh, finally, I want to mention standards and interoperability. IEEE and the Internet Engineering Task Force are key places where standards are made. Some people will tell you standards are stifling of innovation. And there are certain circumstances where that could, could happen. I mean, if you had a really crusty kind of standard and everybody had to stick with it and it was costly to implement and it wasn't malleable to doing anything new, it might indeed stop you from innovating. But on the other hand, well-fashioned standards allow you to interwork with other people without having to have a negotiation. Imagine trying to negotiate standard agreements between a half a million ISPs. I mean, do the n squared over 2 number. Standards eliminate all that by saying, let's all agree to on something in common which allows things to interwork. So when I invent a new application, it has a high probability of working with all those other things that are out in this case on the Internet. So standards are really important because they confer interoperability without having to have these bilateral negotiations. What about the role of government? Government normally is thought of as a large, uh, slow-moving and not necessarily very, very intelligent object. And yet, and yet, in the story of uh, Internet, 
uh, and in other kinds of technologies, the government has often been the only place capable of taking risk for long enough and putting money into efforts long enough to produce results. And so this is, if you take nothing else away from today's talk, my talk anyway, patience and persistence are your friends when you're doing serious, hard work to make something different happen. Patience and persistence, because it may take a lot of time. The ARPANET was funded, and the internet was funded all, for over 20 years, 1969 to 1990 from ARPA. The National Science Foundation started its work in the early 1980s and funded the NSFNet until 1995 when it bravely shut the network down. Why did it do that? They concluded that the universities, 3,000 of them that were connected with the National Science Foundation network, didn't need that network anymore because they were commercial networks in operation. They could buy the service. So they put up network access points and said, all of you ISPs connect to the access points so you're all interconnected with each other just like you used to be through the NSF net. We can shut the NSF net down. All the networks that made up the original internet, the ARPA net, the packet radio net, the packet satellite net, are gone. The internet is still around because it's not just a physical thing. It's an architecture. It's a set of protocols. It's the implementation in software. It's a philosophy. Those things can persist. And so without going through all the details here, let me just point out that some things really do take a long time. Uh, take the uh, LIGO project. This is you know, trying to find gravity waves, laser interferometer for gravity observation. Um, the original ideas started in the 1960s. There was funding from uh, NSF in the amount of about $400 million from 1994 to the present. And it wasn't until just last year, as you all know, that the announcement in, I guess it was actually this year, in February, we, uh, it was announced that we had detected gravitational waves, the actual detection happening in September of 2015. It took a long time to refine that technology to the point where it was sensitive enough to actually detect those waves. And I don't know about you, but I was really excited not only to hear the uh, announcement, but to see the results. There were two LIGO observatories. They both detected the same signal. You could overlay them. This wasn't the question of a very, very fuzzy signal with very low signal to noise ratio. This thing was blam in your face, and it matched exactly the model of two black holes circling each other and finally merging. And so, I mean, for me, that was really exciting. They found another one already, and there are more to come. Uh, the same thing could be said for the Higgs boson, which was predicted uh, in the 1960s and not detectable until 2012, I guess. Um, I can't really see this screen because the damn type is too small. And besides, it keeps going away whenever I want to look at it. Uh, so I don't know, you guys might want to fix that over in the AV space there. Uh, so anyway, the Higgs boson gets predicted, but nobody can build a system that uh, has high enough energy to actually generate one of these things until 2012 with the Large Hadron Collider uh, in Geneva. And so again, things take time. Patience and persistence have really counted here, and government may be one of the few places that can afford to take the time. Okay, a couple of other things. Um, abstraction is your friend often when you're doing serious design work. And the reason for that, quite frankly, is that too much detail gets you so ta tangled up in, uh, in the uh, design process that you lose your way. Now, you know, if you draw block diagrams of things, I love it when you can draw a diagram of a system on one sheet of paper so you can actually see all of it at one time. It's a reminder, here are all the pieces, and don't forget, you know, the, don't forget this part over here. Uh, if it takes multiple sheets of paper, you start to lose context. On the other hand, if you draw one big box and it says, and then a miracle happens inside, that's probably not the best design you, know, you could do. So finding the right level of abstraction at which to do the design and to struggle with the problems is very important. Uh, here's an example. The government typically, when it does procurement, overspecifies what it wants. And in the course of doing that, it stymies innovation. So American companies who uh, have manufacturing done in China will often show up you know, with several hundred pages of spec. And the Chinese companies will produce exactly that. And they do it very well. 
On the other hand, I've watched Chinese companies uh, putting out specs for their products. The specs are much, much less detailed. And what they have done is left room for the manufacturing guy to innovate. Oh, by the way, you know, if we do it this way instead of that way, it's more maintainable. Or I can knock 20% off the cost. Or, you know, I can make these things faster. Or it will scale up better. You need to give people room to innovate. And so that means don't over-specify. The internet is a good example. It's not designed to do anything in particular. All it does is move packets around. Everything else is sitting on top or underneath. Uh, so this is another very interesting thing. I know engineers love to solve problems. And problems get solved more easily sometimes if there are a set of constraints that bound the design space that you're allowed to go into. So when Bob and I were doing our work on the internet, our first constraint was <clears throat> you can't change any of the networks that are part of the internet. And, and you know, after we decided that, because that was a practical decision, and we said, what are the implications of that? Well, one of them is that no network knows it's part of the internet. We didn't make any changes to the packet radio net or the ARPANET or the packet satellite net. We had to build boxes in between, which we called gateways, because we didn't know they were supposed to be called routers. Uh, and so we built gateways in between that knew how to talk to each network and could stick internet packets into the payload of the underlying network. That way, we could add new networks without changing anybody. None of the networks ever had to change. So when the networks went away and new networks came along, the internet is still there because it wasn't about the underlying networks, it was about the gateways and the end-to-end -end protocols in the hosts. So that's, this notion of allowing the constraints to help dictate the solution can sometimes lead you very, very quickly to something that otherwise, in an unconstrained environment, you wouldn't necessarily uh, reach a conclusion for. Uh, and finally, allowing escape hatches is really important. In the case of MCI Mail, for example, we didn't know what all new uh, communication systems would come along, so we left room in our, in our architecture for the possibility of facsimile, for the possibility of telex, for the possibility of new email carriers that we didn't know about at the time. The formats of the MCI Mail, uh, uh, electronic mails, were designed to allow for new kinds of things to come along that we could fit into the system. So allowing yourself some room for expansion is really important. Uh, necessity turns out to be another very strong uh, factor uh, in innovation and design. And, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention, and believe me, it really is true. If you are faced with having to do something, having to make something happen, uh, where there's no choice in the matter, like, you know, the airplane actually has to fly. I mean, we, it's, it's not going to be okay to design an airplane that doesn't fly. So that's a necessity that uh, dictates some of the architecture and design. Uh, but I, I wanted to tell you about my visit to Cuba. Uh, I was there just a few days before the president arrived for the first time uh, in many, many decades. And what impressed me more than anything is that our Cuban colleagues have been faced with a lot of limitations. They didn't have access to a lot of American technology because of the embargo that we had imposed. Uh, and so they had to make do. Sometimes they got access to technology from other companies, but sometimes they just had to make it up as they went along. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm a, uh, an old car, you know, I'm not a buff exactly, but I appreciate old cars. So by the time I got to Cuba, I was having a cargasm every two blocks because <laughs> I was seeing these old 1950s cars roaming the streets like dinosaurs. And, but what was important is after I got a chance to go talk to somebody who had one of these, and I said, what's under the hood? And of course, what's under the hood is a Toyota engine or something in a 1958 Ford uh, Fairlane. These guys have managed, in spite of everything, uh, to innovate their way uh, along, uh, trying to keep things in operation, and I was very impressed by that. The other thing which impressed me is that uh, they are the first, they were the first country to have a National Academy of Science in the Western world. I didn't realize that until I met with the head of the National Academy of Science there. Uh, another thing that is very noticeable is that they have a very, very good medical system there. When I was visiting in Jamaica a few weeks later, I was told by the Jamaicans, whenever they have a medical problem, they look for a Cuban doctor because they're really good. And so I'm hoping as this embargo situation goes away that there will be a lot of interaction. I'm pretty sure that Cuba is going to represent a very important spot of innovation in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, they also made heavy use of open source software for obvious reasons because it was available. 
I was sitting with the president of one of the universities, UCI, who was giving me a presentation. There was a big display at one end of the table, and she had a little uh, Android uh, pad in front of her, and every time she went like that, the display over on the big uh, LG was changing. And I said, that's cool, there are no wires. She says, no, and I said, well, how did you do that? And she said, well, uh, you know, it's just an app that we built for Android. And so my first reaction was, can I have a copy of that? Because where I am, all these damn wires are everywhere, and I hate them. Cables and connectors, you know, pfft. We should, uh, now I'm waiting for some of you to deal with the wireless power, please, so we can get rid of these other damn things. Okay, one other thing which really stunned me. I went to a really nice restaurant, and as we walked down the restaurant, there were toilet bowls filled with flowers. And, you know, well, they didn't have anything else, so that they innovated and turned them into flower pots. So I was impressed simply by the role of necessity in helping them innovate. A couple of other slides, and then we'll finish up. Um, asking the right question turns out to be another key to innovation. Peter Diamandis runs the XPRIZE uh, organization, and you know that that's the one, like for example, there's a $30 million prize for a uh, non-government sector uh, organization to return to the moon, get a rover to go, whatever it is, 250 meters, and send data back. The idea here is a well-defined project that has a well-defined target, so you could say, yes, they made the target, or no, they didn't, is really important. And so that was asking a question in a form that people could address in a very direct way with the motivation to win the prize. Uh, another thing which uh, I think is important about uh, answers, anyway, is to get the right level of abstraction. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, if, it's, if it's too general, you don't get any good answers at all. If it's too complex, if it's too detailed, uh, the answers are not very clear. Uh, those of you who spend a lot of time with math, and I would assume most of you do, uh, you'll notice that sometimes problems expressed in one coordinate system look a lot easier when they're in another. So, you know, Cartesian coordinates, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, is horrible sometimes to work with, but then when you go to uh, polar coordinates, suddenly it's much simpler and the solutions just leap out at you. So it's important to think your way through, can I represent the problem in a different way? Asking what if is often a really good tool for, uh, for innovation because you can ask things that don't exist now that maybe you don't even know how to do, but if you could do that, then what would happen? And sometimes discovering the answer to those questions motivates uh, new results. Uh, one thing I can tell you is how important it is for you, who most of you are younger than I am, that's true of almost everybody in the country these days, uh, but what's important about being young is that you're often too young to know you can't do that. This happens at me, at, to me at Google all the time. I'll have people running up saying, why don't we do X for some value of X? And I'll think, oh, we tried to do X 25 years ago and it didn't work. And then I have to remind myself there's a reason it didn't work. And that reason may no longer be valid. I have had to rethink my positions many times in the last decade because young people have come up saying, why don't we do X? And I have to realize maybe doing X now is exactly the right thing to try. So you're lucky. And this last slide. Um, I wanted to talk about risk because sometimes people are reluctant to take risk, and I was one of them. I am less reluctant now, but I'll tell you a couple of cases where I got taught a lesson. I was a graduate student at UCLA. I worked on the ARPANET project. My thesis had nothing to do with that. It had to do with multiprocessing. Uh, systems, but I was invited to come to Stanford to uh, talk about my dissertation work. This is way back in 1972. Uh, and afterwards, I was invited to join the faculty. While I had been there as an undergraduate, I knew how smart the students were there, and I didn't think I had anything to teach them, and I said no. Well, the faculty didn't take no for an answer. Soon, I got phone calls in a sort of a telephone tree from people who had written the textbooks that I had been studying, like Don Knuth, for example. And so at the end of the day, I said yes. Well, it's a good thing I did, because after I got to Stanford, Bob Kahn and I started working on the internet design, and it might not have happened if I hadn't been up there in that atmosphere. So I'm at Stanford. I'm doing the internet project for DARPA. I've been there for four years, 72 to 76. And they say, why don't you come back to Washington and run the program for us? And I'm sitting here thinking, wow, you know, if I do that and I screw it up, everybody's going to know, because it's very visible. Why would I do that? So I said, no. 
Well, they didn't take no for an answer either. Uh, Bob Kahn was already there. Steve Crocker, my best friend, was there. And uh, others called and said, you know, you can't say no. And finally, my wife said, you know, we've never lived on the East Coast. Why don't we go? That was sort of the final nail in the, in the argument. So, uh, so we went uh, to ARPA. And I guess I can, if I have time, how am I doing here? I haven't paid. Is it all right? I'll, let me explain the three-piece suit. Because uh, this is trademark. I've been wearing three-piece suits for 40 years now. So my wife says, we've never been to you know, the East Coast. Why don't we go? And I said, OK, um, maybe you're right. Uh, but they have snow there. She says, look, I'm from Kansas. You don't know what snow means. You know, so OK. So we go, and she says, Washington, three-piece suits. So she goes to Saks Fifth Avenue at Sanford Shopping Center and gets three three-piece suits, including a seersucker, you know, light white thing for the horrible muggy summers there. So I show up in my three-piece suit at DARPA. And a few weeks after arriving there, I am asked to give testimony to some congressional committee. I don't, honestly don't remember which one now. But I went in my you know, seersucker three-piece you know, summer suit. And I gave my testimony. And I came back and went back to work. and didn't hear anything at all. And then a few weeks later, I get a call from the director of DARPA who says, I want to see you about your testimony. And I'm thinking, oh, well, there goes my government uh, you know, job. I've screwed up somehow. So I went up to the director's office. And he has a letter from the chairman. And he says, um, the chairman says he appreciates very much your testimony. Thank you for, for taking the time. By the way, you're the best dressed guy we've ever seen from ARPA. And that was, that was positive feedback, and I've been wearing three-piece suits ever since. So my advice to you is that while you're young especially, but not necessarily so, take the risky road. When you're young especially, you have plenty of time to recover if it doesn't work out. But the risky road is almost always the most interesting road. The safe one may not do very much. It won't be very exciting. But the risky road could have great rewards. And even if it doesn't work, you're going to learn something from that. And maybe that's the most important lesson of all. If you try stuff and it doesn't work, learn from that so you don't make the same mistake twice. And you may actually figure out why it didn't work, in which case you'll be able to solve the problem. Well, I'll stop there. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. That was fantastic. Uh, we'll entertain a couple of questions. And uh, there are two microphones here, so please line up if you have any questions. Let me get can this have, conversation started. Can we started. have the house lights come up so we can see if there's actually anybody here? I mean, <laughs> I, I talk to myself a lot, but. Uh, Very good. So please introduce yourself and you, uh, tell you us what you're doing. Let me get this conversation started by asking uh, the first question. OK. Uh, I talked about the story of uh, John Shepard Marin and how he invented the ATM. You know, serendipity turns out to be a major force in innovation. And uh, it turns out uh, several years later, he told a journalist that he got the idea from a chocolate vending machine. Really? If you can get a chocolate okay, for 24 yes. hours, why can't I get my cash? Yeah. And so that was the idea. And why it had didn't he do gold bars <laughs> instead of chocolate bars? I think that would be a good question. Fun. OK, all right. Um, but you had used a word, which I think was profound, uh, as part of your own innovation philosophy, future-proof. What did you mean by that? Tell us more about that. So well, future-proofing basically says you don't know what new technologies are going to come along. And even if you don't know and specifically, you might know enough about the possible technology or its behavior to take that into account. And so in the case of the internet, two pieces. One, we knew at the time, this is in 1973, that there would almost certainly be new ways of transmitting bits, new kinds of technology, microwave, you know, satellite links, optical fiber. Even then, optical fiber wasn't exactly on the radar screen, but, but we knew there would be new, new developments. That's what engineers do. And so we said, let's be careful not to allow mm -hmm. the internet to know too much about the underlying transmission system so that when new ones come along, we don't have to change anything in the internet layer of protocol. And so it's information hiding that I would consider uh, future-proofing at that underlying layer. The same thing could be said for the upper layers that rode on top of uh, IP. We said there could be new protocols. TCP was one of them. UDP was another. But there are others now that have come along. We left room in the architecture for people to innovate, to put in new 
protocols. Quick, for example, is a new one that Google has developed recently, which collapses a lot of layers into one to reduce the amount of round trip time for reestablishing uh, connections. So the idea was to leave room for innovation. That is what I consider to be future proofing. I think there's a deeper lesson for leadership here and our professional preparation for career development and so forth, being future proof. I think we have a first question so, here. Uh, well, before we do, let me just add one other observation. One of the things that made the internet so successful is that we knew that other people would have good ideas. And so when you design a system that has room for other people's mm -hmm. innovative ideas, you let them capitalize on that. You allow them to participate. This was probably one of the most global grand collaborations you can think of. Mm -hmm. When you look at the way the internet works with half a million different networks, it's not centrally controlled. That's deliberate. The business models vary from network to network. That's deliberate. And so this, it's this flexibility within a framework that makes a huge difference. And from my point of view, we have all benefited from the ideas that people have felt free to bring to the table to make the internet better. Okay, truly, we have a question over here. Please say your name and where you're from. Yep, speak to the microphone, yeah. Um, hello, my okay. name is Miriam. Hi. I'm going to, you know, the way this is working, I'm hearing impaired, right, two hearing aids. Uh, there's a light right in my face, so I can't even see you when you're talking, so television camera, track. Yes, now I can see you. Right. Hello. So, I'd first like to say thank you for uh, creating the, or inventing the internet. Or part of that. <laughs> um, that, that has really changed the way we get information and that's a big part of our culture now. So um, so when you were inventing the um, inventing the internet, did you ever consider like how much of an impact you would ha it would have on our culture and did you take that into consideration now like what the impact of your new inventions will be? So this is, this is a really important question, so thank you for asking that. And it's, imp it's important for several reasons. The first one is that engineers should be attentive to the effects of what they do, the effects of their design. And I will confess to you that Bob and I didn't know all the things that were gonna happen with the internet. I wish we could. Sometimes Bob says, oh, you know, this whole thing is working exactly as planned. By the way, in about 15 minutes, the following thing is gonna happen. It isn't that way. But I have to say that we recognized how powerful this could be. Because when we did the design, we, we were thinking globally. We were thinking an arbitrary number, unknown number of networks would participate. We even went through a little exercise and we said, um, how many termination points do we need? And uh, we said, well, let's see, how many networks will there be per country? And we thought, well, there are at least two. So there'd be some competition. <laughs> Because, well, we'd just done the ARPANET and it wasn't exactly inexpensive to do that. And we thought, well, there'll be at least two global or two national scale networks. So then we said, how many countries are there? And there wasn't any Google to ask. So, uh, so we guessed at 128 because that was a power of two, you know, and that's what programmers think in. So we ended up with a 4.3 billion termination uh, address space, which we ran out of in 2011. Fortunately, in 1996, the IPv6 format came along. Uh, after four years of hard discussion, and that's 128 bits of address space. It's enough to last until after I'm dead, then it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> so, so uh, but we also had the benefit of several years of experience with ARPANET. So think about this, it's 1973, we're designing the internet, what do we have on the ARPANET? Well, we had uh, Doug Engelbart's online system, we had Mouse, and, and we had uh, Xerox Parks example, and SRI International's example of mice, uh, portrait mode displays, point and click, hyperlinking. Okay, so we had all that stuff and several years of experience with it in 1973. Uh, we had the notion of personal computing, again, thanks to Xerox Park. Ethernet existed a mile and a half from my lab at Stanford, 
um, Bob Metcalf and uh, David Boggs were inventing the first 3.3 megabit ethernets. And so we actually had quite a bit of experience in, in terms of the sorts of things that we do today uh, back then. We couldn't predict everything that was going to happen, obviously. Now, of course, we see a global phenomenon. I was told by uh, Eric Schmidt, though, that I'm not allowed to retire. I said, why not? And he said, because you're only half done. Only 50% of the world is online. You have another 50% to go. So <clears throat> I could use some help. Uh, so the answer is that we didn't know everything, but we had a pretty good idea. This is going to be powerful stuff. By the way, that was Miriam. She's a high school student from Boston. A round of applause for her. She's the youngest participant in the Future Leaders Forum. I see there are six people waiting so, to ask questions. I, and I was wondering if we could maintain it tweet size so that we can be efficient at the timing oh, here. Because we got several. OK, here we go again. It's going to be difficult. I don't have a Twitter account. So uh, <laughs> let's do that. Uh, OK, so my question is on basically your presentation. How are you so good at it? Like, uh, you were making us all laugh. You were making us all laugh while talking about such complicated projects as like Lockheed or ARPANT and things that have innovated, well, affected the whole world and are highly technical. How do you, how did you, as an engineer, as a person with a background of technical knowledge, mm -hmm. make that switch and presentation mm -hmm. to the crowd? Yeah. yeah, this is actually another really important question. When my engineers sometimes ask, you know, how can I be effective? The answer is learn how to sell. Sales is about getting other, your ideas in other people's heads. And so finding ways for them to grasp the ideas. So I use a simple metaphor for internet. It's postcards. Everything you know about a postcard is true of an internet packet, right? The, it, it has a to address and a from address, and it has some content. The postcard doesn't know what you wrote on it, neither does the internet packet. Put two postcards in the post box to the same destination. They may not come out in the same order you put them in. They may not come out at all. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, best effort system. Of course, in the internet, if you put in a packet, sometimes you get two because it got duplicated from alternate routing. And there's, you know, there are other analogies here, but it helps a lot. So metaphors are your friend. And lest you disparage marketing and sales, remember that if they are not successful, you won't get paid. And so you want your, your uh, sales team to be successful. We'll go over here. First of all, I'd like to shake your hand. Hi. You worked at WorldCom as well. Ah, wow. So. Oh, I hate that word. <laughs> but the technology yes, right. is great with you, Unit. Um, my question is, um, as a visionary, uh, where do you see the internet going, especially as it's related to software-defined networking and virtualization, and also with cybersecurity? You talked about the postcard, and anybody can read that postcard, and there's you know, a lot of different faults yeah. with security, wow. okay. and we're trying to overcome those. So I'm just curious of your thoughts. And, and you know, I'm supposed to have a tweet-sized response to mm -hmm. the toughest questions. Of, all right. Three, three points. First of all, those are all very good questions. Uh, with regard to where the internet's going, it's clear that we have higher speeds, more radio-based stuff, uh, more uh, fiber networking and things like that. Uh, with regard to software-defined networking, I find that a weird term because it's really all software. It's always been software. It's software in the routers. Uh, and there's some hardware for speed up. Uh, but the virtualization is a trick that the computer scientists have used forever. When they run out of real stuff, they virtualize it, right, like virtual memory. And that's kind of what's going on here. It gives you much more flexibility because now you're operating at a layer where you have something to say about the scope and scale of the, uh, and the way in which these virtual routers actually function. So you're, you are removed from some of the hardware dependencies that you would otherwise have. Uh, I, some of you know that I've been working on an interplanetary extension of the network uh, with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the rest of the NASA labs. That's in operation now between Earth and Mars, the International Space Station, and at least one uh, orbiting uh, satellite that's in, in solar orbit right now. I just uh, spent two days at NASA Ames with the team that's doing the uh, interplanetary network, and they are uh, moving very, very rapidly towards uh, infusion into some of the space missions that are coming up during the 2020s. So you will see a growing interplanetary backbone. It's not running TCP IP. We had to do some special things, uh, different protocols to deal with the fact that there's 40 minute round trip times between Earth and <laughs> Mars, for example. Flow control doesn't work very well at 40 minute round trip times. 
to say nothing of planetary motion, you know, where you're talking to something on the surface and the, you haven't figured out how to stop the planets from rotating. So, <laughs> so, uh, so you have to wait until it comes back around again. So there's a lot of delay and disruption involved. Unfortunately, I, uh, as, as the time has it, we'll just have one more question on uh, each okay, side. Okay, so I'll be Thank careful you. about that. You're right, it's 10 o'clock. Yeah, uh, we'll take one from each side. And uh, you can interact okay. with Ben during the break. So, I'll, yeah, so security, well, this is just going to take a lot of hard work. We have to learn how to write software that doesn't have bugs. Yeah. That's the real answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real answer, and we need tools to help us do that. Some of that is feasible. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, uh, Entertaining your analogy of, of the postcard, what's the most surprising thing that you've discovered people have been using the postcard for? I'm sorry, most, most <clears throat> exciting uh, application of postcards? Um, in, in general, what's the most surprising use of the oh, internet? Oh, 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 okay. Well, you know, to be really honest with you, uh, I had not anticipated the World Wide Web. We had something that looked, you know, we had file transfers and we had some, you know, file, you know, AltaVista and a few other things that, or even before that, uh, Archie uh, and some of the other search engines that were just looking for files. It was the World Wide Web that really surprised me. It wasn't the technology that surprised me, it was what people did with it. <laughs> Once it became easy for people to generate information and put it into the web, and the internet of course propagated that everywhere, uh, people just poured content into the net. I was really surprised at the desire that people had to share what they knew. Not to be paid, but for the satisfaction of knowing that what they knew was useful to someone else. And frankly, it blew me away. It's still true. It's still true. So Tim Berners-Lee, when he invented HTTP and HTML for a particular purpose for his physics people to share information, unleashed an avalanche of sharing across the internet. And we're still experiencing the positive and sometimes negative results of that. Which leads me to one last point, which is that this is a neutral technology. It gets used and it gets abused. And that's common for infrastructure. It's like cars on the road, people get drunk and they drive and they hurt themselves and other people. We don't stop building roads and we don't stop building cars because they are too valuable to the economy. The same is true of the internet. But we have to deal with people who harm themselves and others, especially on the net. We have to find a way to deal with that. Cryptography is not the sole solution, so don't let anybody tell you that, although it has a role to play in strong authentication and confidentiality. But some of this is social. Our social intuitions about the tools that we have today are still very immature. We are going to have to live through cases of abuse that we didn't think of until we understand what the scope of potential social hazards are, and then as a society we're going to have to respond to them. And the last sweet and short question oh, yeah, from one you. more, really? Okay. Okay, so my name is Abdul Rahman. Hi. I'm from the uh, Region 6, the Young Professionals Chair for the Seattle Section and the Power and Energy Society. My question is this. Uh, technology is being innovated every day. New and faster mobile phones, self-driving cars. Um, you know, pretty soon we'll have people going on the moon for uh, a short price. Uh, but the question is that some of these technologies are very disruptive to the environment and to uh, society. So uh, uh, with that given said, what is the best way to introduce disruptive technology? Like, for example, uh, wireless power transfer on the transmission scale. So hundreds of megawatts that's being transmitted wirelessly that just that just completely destroys the power systems that have been built. Well, wait, let's, uh, let me try to respond to this. First of all... I think um, there was a question somewhere. Yeah, so. the, yeah. No, the, the question is what to do about the potential hazards and negative side effects of disruptive technology. Uh, I sometimes wonder whether if we were having this conversation about 900 AD, you would come and ask me, what is going to be the sociological side effect of the long bow, which has just been invented by the press? Uh, and it had a huge impact on, uh, on things because you could go after an enemy who was a lot farther away than a spear length, and so it changed the nature of war at that time. So let's, let's um, pay attention to a couple of things. First of all, uh, disruption is going to happen whether we like it or not. Okay, technology moves on. These people in the room are people who invent new things based on what they know from physics and engineering and electronics. 
And so that's going to happen. The disruption is inescapable. The question is, can you adapt to it? And we're in the middle of experiencing disruption, for example, in the news business. It used to be that newspaper was the cheapest way of getting a lot of information out to everybody on a regular basis, but that's not true anymore. Now, online services are much more facile, they're faster, and the advertising industry that drives that is now more specialized. We show specific ads, like in the case of Google, to people rather than having to show everybody the same thing. So businesses that fail to adapt are the ones that are harmed, and that may not be the end of the world. I don't consider that necessarily to be horrible. The whole industrial revolution put whole industries out of business, replacing them with something else. The real challenge is the jobs that are lost by disruptive innovation are not necessarily going to be, um, well, they will be replaced with other jobs. I am confident of that. The question is, are the people who are displaced from the old jobs capable of doing the new ones? And the answer may be no. Then the question is, how do we deal with that? And the answer is exactly the answer that IEEE is handing you right in front of you, which is keep learning. Keep learning throughout your career. You're going to live to 100 years. You're going to have to have multiple careers. You're going to have to learn new things in order to stay productive. And so if there's any lesson to come out of disruptive technology, it is that one. We must keep learning, we must keep innovating, and we must make ourselves relevant as time goes on. And I think we'll stop there. And thank, thank you so thank much, you. Ben.